I want to thank not only Jim, but Ar Arlene Sachs for inviting me to be with you tonight um, to share some ideas that I, I hope you'll find interesting, uh, that may stretch your thinking, and that ultimately you will find useful. Because as a person who spent 25 years in the superintendency and 35 years in the field of education, uh, if it wasn't useful, ultimately, it didn't make any difference to me. It had to be ultimately applicable and useful. Uh, I'd like to start, because I'm an educator, with an assignment for you. I'm your teacher, and so here's your assignment. We're going to be here together for a while tonight, an hour, hour and a half, and I'm going to share many ideas. You only have to listen for one idea that you want to take forward with you for the rest of your life. I've been to so many keynotes and afterwards somebody said, what did that person talk about? Well, I'm not exactly sure. I want you to be able to say, I learned one thing from Steve Sokolow and this is what I learned. And if I ask you three years from now or five years from now or ten years from now, you'll say that one thing. So you decide what it is for you. But I ask you to listen for one thing and then I think tonight will be successful. Now, uh, how did I get here tonight? I want to explain a concept, one of the principles of uh, spiritual leadership, enlightened leadership, uh, called synchronicity. And I'm here because of synchronicity. And, uh, I don't know if you've heard the term before. The term was coined by Carl Jung, who was Sigmund Freud's disciple. And um, much has been written about synchronicity since Carl Jung came up with this notion. There's actually a book with the title, Synchronicity. You read a whole book about, about it. The author's name is Joseph Jaworski. He is Leon Jaworski's son, Leon Jaworski of Watergate fame, depending upon whether you recall that or not. Uh, he's also a colleague of Peter Senge at MIT, uh, Peter wrote The Fifth Discipline, and Joe Jaworski and Peter worked together. And he wrote this book called Synchronicity. And um, here is the, there are many definitions of synchronicity, but here's the one that I think is the easiest to capture. Synchronicity is a meaningful coincidence. Now that sounds paradoxical to the Western mind. It's a meaningful coincidence. So here are some meaningful coincidences that resulted in us being together tonight. First, 33 some years ago, Jim Henderson and I wound up in the same place. Jim is vice principal, me is my first superintendency. Over time, it didn't take me long, I realized how talented Jim was. I promoted him to become principal. And then it didn't take too long, and I promoted him to be my assistant superintendent. And then it didn't take too long, because Jim was ready, and I was able to play a role, because we're all networking. For the rest of your lives, it's already happening, but we network and we help each other. And so I, Jim wanted to go to uh, the Reading area, um, first as assistant superintendent, then ultimately a superintendent. I had a uh, colleague from my doctoral work uh, a phone call was made and Jim was an instant finalist. And so on and so forth. His career has been stellar and uh, the ripple effects in terms of what he has done uh, truly is, is remarkable and I'm very proud. But part of the synchronicity story is that while Jim was with me in uh, Central Jersey, he introduced me to Paul Houston. Paul Houston was the superintendent in Princeton, who later became superintendent in Tucson, and later became the uh, executive director of the American Association of School Administrators, a position he held for 14 years. He's now emeritus. I wouldn't know Paul Houston if it weren't for Jim Henderson. Then, synchronicity, and I won't tell you all the details, took me to Harvard for 15 summers where I spent time with Paul Houston. And Paul and I got to know each other and become friends and colleagues. And we decided 
at some point that we would write a book together, actually a series of books. So the, the book that we wrote is The Spiritual Dimension of Leadership. We have a, a number of others in the pipeline. We have an organization we call the Center for Empowered Leadership. Paul is the president. I serve as executive director. All because of synchronicity. Had Jim and I not been in the same place, recognized certain things in each other that allowed our lives to become entangled, and I mean that the way scientists talk about entanglement in a positive way, and then over the last 33 years, we have continued to support and help each other and use our networks together to do good things in the world, all because of synchronicity. So that's one of the principles, um, spiritual principles. Now, Paul and I like this concept so much, we wrote a chapter about it. We didn't write a whole book about it, but we wrote a chapter. And we do, did all of our chapters in dialogue initially. And we discovered something very interesting. Uh, I asked Paul what he knew about synchronicity and he asked me what I knew about it. And I said, well, I only know this. I've had a life experience that when things show up in my life three times in fairly close proximity from different sources, I feel that I'm getting a message from the universe that I should be paying attention to. And every time I've paid attention to something that has shown up in my life three times, something good happened as a result of my paying attention to that. And Paul said, well, that's kind of interesting. He said, I've had the same life experience, except, except for me. He said, every time it showed up twice, I moved on it. I said, well, now I realize you're just smarter than I am. It took me the third time to get the message. And so in our chapter, we call synchronicity the rule of twos or threes. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that um, there is a, this, a principle that's operating in the universe that's as fundamental as gravity, and that the universe presents us with information that's helpful to us in our lives, professionally and personally. And all we have to do is be aware of the messages that we are receiving. Friends, colleagues, newspapers, books, TVs, radio, movies, you don't know where it's gonna come from. But if something crosses your consciousness two or three times, pay attention and see what happens. And the more aware you are of this concept, the more you will see it playing a role in your life. We don't have enough time tonight to get into the details of kind of how it works and why it works, but at least you can uh, try it. So with that as a start, I've listed up on the screen our common purpose, because I know we have a common purpose. And when I signed Susan's book, I said, in common purpose. Our common purpose, I know every one of you is an educator. And therefore, you want to make the world a better place. And that is our common purpose, to make the world better. Every educator I know wants to do that. How you do that is up to you <coughs> and what form it takes. But we share that. The form that Paul and I and the people associated with our organization have selected, which we call our mission statement, is this to empower enlightened leadership throughout the world through the expression of universal spiritual principles. Fairly straightforward statement. This is the way we feel we can make a contribution in terms of making the world a better place. Now, when you look at that statement, there are a number of concepts in there that almost beg for uh, unpeeling you know, the onion or under, you know, what is meant by some of these terms. And the one that I'd like to focus on right now is the term enlightened leadership. Um, most people I know would like to be thought of as an enlightened leader. I haven't met too many people who said, no, that's not for me. I don't want to be an enlightened leader. Uh, but what is an enlightened leader? Thank you. And the, so Paul and I talked about 
what do we mean by enlightened leadership? Peter Drucker and Richard Farson, Farson wrote a great book called He Who Makes the Most Mistakes Wins. Uh, he's a, a corporate guru. They both distinguish between managers and leaders. And they say, give me a good manager, and a manager will do things in the right way. They'll figure out how to get it done. Arlene was talking about that today. I'll get it done. And it'll be done in the right way. It's not easy to do things in the right way. And that, I think, is a very succinct notion of what a manager is. But what Drucker and Farson say a leader is, a leader can do that, but they also know the right things to do. We're making choices all the time as leaders. Resources, time allocation, whatever you're going to be doing, and knowing the right thing to do is one of the things that we think distinguishes leaders from people who are pure managers because they can, they know how to do it, but they also know what needs to be done. Paul and I said, okay, that's pretty good, but that's, there's something else missing in terms of enlightened leadership. And we came up with two notions that we felt were missing to turn from a leader to an enlightened leader. And the third element that we added is a sense of timing to do things at the right time. You think throughout your life so many things that either you were too soon and circumstances were not ready for the you know, fruition and manifestation to occur, or you were a little too late, and again, it didn't happen. Le enlightened leaders have an incredible sense of timing. Uh, there's a phrase that's that, uh, uh, common, uh, timing is everything. And so when you add the right timing, uh, I don't want to get political, but I think if you look at some of the accomplishments of the lame duck session in Congress, some of those things were not possible before the lame duck session was the lame duck session, and they would not have been possible in the new session starting in the next couple of days. But the timing for what was, happened was perfect for some major accomplishments. That, to me, is one of the hallmarks of enlightened leadership, getting the timing right. We don't stop there. We say it takes one more element. And the fourth element is the, uh, essentially, it's the, the motivation. It's what is the reasoning, the intention, behind the leader's action. And when that intention is also right, that's when you get the four elements that you need for enlightened leadership. So people sometimes say, well, how do you know if uh, I'm doing something for the right reasons? Because frequently there are a multitude of reasons of why we do things. A short, a short test of whether something is the right reason from our value system is this. If it's other directed, if the focus is on you, then you're probably not coming from an enlightened place. If the focus is on serving others outside of yourself in a larger context, then in all likelihood, whatever it is you're trying to do is coming from an enlightened place. So here are the four elements. What is enlightened leadership? It's doing the right things in the right way at the right time for the right reasons. So you've heard the statement that two wrongs don't make a right. So now you can have a new statement. Four rights make an enlightened leader. Those are the four rights that will move you in the direction of enlightened leadership. Now, if you know people who tend to do things in the right way, the right time, and you've gotten to know them well enough to know what their, their reasons are, and 
They're, you know, and it's the right thing to do from your perspective. And you see them doing it over and over and over and over again. We have another word that we sometimes use to describe people like that. And that is wise. Enlightened leadership is another way of talking about wisdom. It's based on wisdom, and it's a manifestation of wisdom. I have the phrase there, enlightened leaders are wise leaders. Enlightened leadership and wisdom are inextricably tied to one another. In fact, the next book that Paul and I are working on is titled The Wise Leader. And so now the question is, okay, uh, it sounds good. How do I become wise? Like, who wouldn't like to be wise? We have some notion in our society that if you live long enough, you know, in your 80s and 90s, and you're a reflective practitioner, that maybe you have some wisdom to share. But that, I've been more of a hurry than that. And wouldn't it be better if our world were populated by wise leaders who were your age? And think about the world that we would have if our leaders at all levels were truly wise. So it brings up the notion as to whether wise leaders can be cultivated or whether you just happen to be you know, a wise person in a young body. Paul and I believe that we can actually cultivate wisdom. And the question is, how? So I need to share with you, we have three core beliefs that are tied to the notion of how it is that we can inculcate and develop wisdom in each other and in other people and in ourselves. So here are the three core beliefs. I, I always think it's important for people to know where you're coming from. They may not agree with you, but at least put it on the table and say, this is what I believe, and we'll have a time to talk a little later, and here's why. So here's our first core belief. We have been endowed with an array of spiritual principles. So it's our position that the spiritual principles that Paul and I write about you are endowed with. They're in you. I don't have to put them in you. You already have them. You came hardwired from the factory with these endowed principles. Sometimes we call it your spiritual DNA or another uh, concept that Paul and I like to use uh, is a uh, these are uh, archetypical seeds. Now, you would have to be familiar with Carl Jung's writings to understand the concept of archetypes. But the general notion is this. Think of a regular seed. It might be a seed for an acorn tree. It might be a seed for a rose bush. I mean, every seed has a potential to be something kind of wonderful. But it needs the right conditions. If the seed gets the water it needs and the soil it needs and the light it needs, it will be what it was meant to be and what it can be. We're like that. We have seeds in us, spiritual seeds that are very common. In a few minutes when I start talking about some of these ideas, everybody's going to say, well, I, I'm familiar with that. I'm familiar with that. Of course you are. It's a part of who you are already. I'm going to try to shed a light on it in a new light, but these are ideas that you already know deep down. So we're endowed with an array of spiritual principles, and they are uh, archetypical in the sense that they are um, energy patterns that exist within you that under certain conditions, um, they will grow. So here is the condition under which the seeds will grow. You have to be aware of them. The seed won't grow unless you have some knowledge that you've got it. And your consciousness focusing on those seeds, it will activate them. It's like the water that 
gets the little seed to open. And once they get activated, something uh, miraculous begins to happen. You will become more powerful. Everybody I know wants to be wise. Everybody I know wants to be powerful. This is one of the ways that you can gain power, nurturing these seeds that you already have. And then something even more magical happens. When you do it within yourself, it begins to spread to other people, like Jim Henderson. It's, it's a, a natural process that happens energetically when, um, here's another concept from science that might be helpful. Um, there's a branch of science called chaos theory. And chaos theory tries to look at the fundamental patterns in the universe. There's quantum mechanics, there's chaos theory, and I'm, I'm very interested in science and lessons that science has to teach us. The concept from chaos theory that I find so powerful is the concept of the strange attractor. Now, uh, you might be surprised to learn that I am delighted to be a strange attractor. Arlene is a strange attractor. I had lunch with her today, and it's very clear. It's very clear. Being a strange attractor is a very good thing. Because what happens in the natural world around the strange attractor is that particles begin to aggregate around this attractive force. And as the particles aggregate, they grow from disorder to order in increasing orders of complexity until ultimately you get us. I mean, everything in the universe has been formed from these strange attractor patterns of particles at a fundamental level that ultimately uh, arise in consciousness and human beings. So this is a process that we can contribute to intentionally. Arlene and I talked today about walking the talk. It didn't take me long in conversation with Arlene and Jim to get a sense of the culture that is here. And I, I kind of knew Roger before I met him because of the stories that they were telling. There is a wonderful culture here. The people here walk their talk. They have certain values. Their values are clear. They live them. And this organization, I can already tell, is an, is an example of an enlightened organization in the way that it functions. I may give you some language to put on some of the actions that are already here, but uh, it's already happening. People like Arlene attract other quality people. People like you will attract other quality people into this program. That's the way the universe is structured. We like will attract like if we let it. And you can be a strange attractor and you can then attract um, not only people, but that's what we're going to get into now with the principles. There's something that goes on, this, is, this goes far beyond people. Because these same ideas operate with respect to these spiritual principles. Paul and I identified 35 spiritual principles of leadership. We do not claim, now or ever, that we've identified them all. I don't know whether they're 45, 55, or 105. And I'm sure over time other people are going to contribute to this body of knowledge and say, here are some more important ones that should be uh, included. But Paul and I agreed upon these 35. We also agreed upon seven lenses of awareness. And that's going to be the title of um, our third or fourth book. Um, and the lenses of awareness are things like uh, learning lessons from the natural world that we can use in leadership. They're just ways of looking at the world that transcend all 35 principles. Now, we've listed them on our website, you know, CFEL, Center for Empowered Leadership org, so you can, you can see them there. 
We took eight of the 42 uh, spiritual principles and lenses of awareness and we put them into our first book. So this book represents about 20% of the body of knowledge that Paul and I have uh, created and eventually will have in published form uh, for other people to uh, share and use. Now, here are the eight principles that we included in our first book. And I just want to recap. These principles serve as strange attractors. They're in you, they can empower you, and they can empower other people. The first is the principle of intention. Uh, Wayne Dyer wrote an entire book on the notion of intention. Um, he's not alone. Many of the things that we've written a chapter about, other people have written entire books about, which is fine because these are universal principles. I would expect other people to be writing about them and whatever their take happens to be. Uh, what I want to share, I'm just going to give you, we wrote a chapter about this. Wayne has a book about it. I'll give you just a few thoughts. Our intentions have power far beyond what most people realize. There are experiments being done today in terms of human consciousness and the power of individual intention and the power of collective intention. And we are learning that human thought and human intention has real power in the world. So you can think of it in traditional ways of, well, I'll set a goal and that will be my intention and that's fine. But I'm also suggesting to you that there's an underlying energy aspect to these principles that will affect the way you function as leaders and the way other people respond to you and what it is they can learn from you and do with you. So a couple of quick things about intention. Um, as leaders, we need to be clear as to what our intentions are in any given circumstance. And the clearer we can be in letting other people know what our intentions are, the more they can begin to see where they might fit in relation to those intentions. Because most people would like to align themselves with the intentions of the leaders that they've opted to work with. But they can't do that if they don't know what your intentions are. And one of the things I've learned since the days that Jim and I worked together is to be much more open and clear about what my intentions are in the leadership positions that I hold. I used to keep a lot of them closer to the vest or for the people that I trusted the most. I now realize that it's very hard for other people to guess your intentions. There's too much projecting in the world. People project their notions onto your actions. So the way to avoid that is to be clear about what your intentions are. Ultimately, you can write your intentions out. You can speak about them you know, in various forums. You can hold dialogue sessions about them. You can have planning sessions about them. They become the starting point, ultimately, to have your intentions take physical form and manifest in the real world. Um, over the years, I can't tell you how many things started as an intention that turned out to be reality. And so uh, that's the first principle I wanted to highlight for you. Second is the principle of attention. And here's a catchy little phrase that you can remember about attention. Where attention goes, energy flows. And that is another truism about the way the world works. Now, so if you're a leader and you pay attention to certain things, you will find that other people in your organization pay attention to those things, whether you want them to or not. So it might be good for you to pay attention to the things you want them to pay attention to because they're watching. And so 
Attention takes many forms. A budget is a form of intention, attention. The resources that you apply, the care that you take in creating a meal or making a speaker feel welcome is a form of attention. It's where you put your energy in thought to do something in the right way. And good things happen as a result of that. Attention has power. And so that's a second principle that can grow in you and grow in other people and actually be used intentionally. Third principle that we cover in uh, the this, this spiritual dimension of leadership is unique gifts and talents. We believe, and we're not alone, that every single human being has unique gifts and talents. Every single human being. No exceptions. If schools were organized around figuring out what those unique gifts and talents are and nurturing them, what a world we might have. I can tell in talking conversations with Arlene, she looks at the unique gifts and talents of her faculty, and they in turn look at your unique gifts and talents to see how to take your passion and cultivate it in terms of your growth. You're cultivating unique gifts and talents. We all have something to give, and different things at different stages of our lives. If we organize our schools and our organizations around people's gifts and talents, miraculous things happen because people want to share them. Many organizations, they don't even know what the gifts and talents of the people are who are working for them. Never even bothered to ask. Um, fourth principle, gratitude. The power of gratitude is just enormous. And... Uh, I'm grateful for being invited here. The gratitude that matters is only the gratitude that comes from the heart. The gratitude that comes from the head is an interesting idea. It doesn't seem to have a lot of power. But the gratitude that's coupled with true feeling is felt by the person to whom the gratitude is being expressed or received. And it is empowering all of these principles are empowering. When somebody says to you, you did a really good job. I'm grateful to you, Marie, for the kind of dissertation that you put together and the diligence and the timeliness and the way you handled everything almost like a model. Not only does that make a person like Marie feel justifiably good about herself and empowers her, Everybody around the table that heard that story was empowered by it. There's a ripple effect when gratitude is genuinely expressed and shared. In an organization, when you show the people that you're working with that you're grateful for them and for what they're doing to help you be successful, because none of us can be successful without a whole lot of people working their butts off. Well. When you take the time to express gratitude, and there's many, many ways, obviously, to do that, most people, what do they want to do? They want to do more. They don't want to do less. They want to do more. Well, that's pretty good. If I'm a leader and all I have to do is express my true feelings to somebody about what they've done, and now not only did they do that, but they want to do even more, that's leverage. So. I'm not suggesting that you use it um, to manipulate people. I'm simply saying that the very act of using gratitude from your heart in a sincere way will have a positive effect in your organization and on you. Fifth principle that we covered in this book is our unique life lessons. We. Um, Paul and I talk about the fact that we believe it, it's kind of fortunate that we're educators because not only have we spent most of our lives in schools and learning institutions of various types, but we actually think Earth is school. We think we all live in Earth school and that we're actually here to learn certain lessons as human beings. 
And so it's pretty good to be an educator because we're all in school. And um, life gives us lessons to learn all the time. And um, sometimes we master them fairly easily. Sometimes they're very, very difficult. Um, recognizing that we are given lessons to help us grow and become the very best human beings that we can be helps us look at the challenges that we face in a different light. And as a leader, you can reframe for people who are going through very difficult times in terms of what is the possible lesson here that may make you a better human being or may put you in a position where you can empower someone else as a result of what you've learned. So that's another spiritual principle that we are endowed with. The principle of a holistic perspective. Um, some of you are familiar with systems thinking. And Peter Senge and others have done a wonderful job of helping people both in the private and public sector uh, think systemically and the way organizations function as systems. I believe that our concept of holistic thinking is a bigger concept than systems thinking. System thinking is a subset of holistic thinking. And enlightened leaders tend to be holistic in the way they look at the world. They try to look at all the different aspects of something from as many angles as they can to see how they fit into larger and larger patterns. There are people who believe that our entire universe is, a is basically a hologram, that it has holographic qualities, which means that there are underlying connections to all things in the universe, and that from a whole, and that not only are these things, is everything connected in some mysterious way, but there is a mysterious relationship between the whole and its parts, and the parts and the whole. And that as an enlightened leader, if you can understand some of those patterns, you can work on a part, and suddenly the whole gets transformed. It's a very powerful notion of leadership to begin to look for something called the fractals within your organization and energize those fractals so that they can expand into larger versions of themselves until they affect the entire culture and organization. That's my little timer. Um, so I'm going to one minute on the next two. Uh, the principle of openness. Uh, many people have written about open versus closed cultures. You, you, we all know open versus closed people. And cultivating an open perspective as a leader will put you in a position where people will come to you. Uh, I'm using Arlene a lot, but she taught me a lot today. She, said she, she says to her children, tell me the truth. I'll always protect you and I'll always be there for you. But I need to know the truth. She was nearly operating from the principle of openness. She wants to have the next principle, which is coming up, which is the principle of trust. Trust me enough to be open with me, and I will protect you, and good things will happen, even if you're telling me a bad thing. That's true for leaders. You know, if you can create a culture where people are open to you, where they will talk with you about the difficulties as well as the su successes, you've got an opportunity as a leader to take action at an early stage and make the kinds of changes that need to be made from getting real information because you've created a culture where people know that uh, there's openness and people know that there's trust. Um, I do whole full day seminars on any one of these topics, so I'm just flying by quickly to give you a flavor for the power of some of these spiritual principles. What I want to do now is let's have some interaction, questions and comments before we shift to the next section of what we're going to be doing. Yes? How do you 
Yes. Yes. What, what um, I'd like you to think about in terms of that, these principles, the eight of them that I've just covered and the others that make up our 35, when you actually live those principles and embody them, which is the ultimate form, we say practice them, express them, but walk your talk, the ultimate is if you actually live in accordance with these ideas, what you will find is you will be a wiser leader. It's sort of, it just happens that these are the ingredients that contribute to wisdom. That we, when we do these things and embody them, others, we don't, you don't call yourself wise. I mean, you know, you can call yourself a wise ass. I'm a wise ass. Jim was a wise ass. But you don't call yourself wise. But other people will say, whoa, they're really wise in the way they're handling that horrible, difficult circumstance. And what Paul and I found over the years, when we were at Harvard together, and we had our breaks and we talked, and everybody else was talking about a budget crisis or the latest curriculum or whatever it is they were talking about. We were talking about the underlying values that we were using to guide us in the difficulties and the vicissitudes of life. These are some of the underlying values and principle that become kind of a series of north stars that will guide you because you're all educators. It's complicated out there. It's, you know, circumstances are very difficult. And so we all need something to guide us. Our experience is that if we're guided by these principles, we usually don't go wrong. And that it's a journey. You, you won't wake up tomorrow. It's, and, and, and I wanna, I'm glad you asked me this question because Paul and I kid each other. Um, we'll be on the phone and we'll be talking. We'll say, I wasn't such an enlightened leader today. And, you know, and we joke with each other because even though you may know all these principles and even though you work real hard to embody them, it's easy to fall off the wagon. It's sort of like you're trying to steer a boat uh, and you've got it pointed in a certain direction, except the waves are moving you and the wind is moving you and suddenly you're over here and you thought you were trying to go here. And so then these things serve as reminders to kind of get you back on track. So uh, I wanted to share with you, it's not like, okay, well, I finally made it. I'm an enlightened leader. It's, it's a journey that you're constantly striving in the direction of and continually reflecting on how you're doing and then using these things to kind of get back on target. And the more you do it, then the more likely it is that you're operating, doing the right things in the right way at the right time for the right reasons. Was that responsive? Yes. It's not over yet. <laughs> We're only halfway there. <laughs> Yes. Which kind of coordinates. And I had a health challenge one time, and sometimes experiencing that one may grow through mm -hmm. helps you to embrace what you're saying. My grandmother would call it, we had that vision of a strong heart that would kind of serve as an eye opener. Prior to Thank you for sharing that. Um, 
synchronicity and other things al almost seem magical when you open up yourself to some of these ideas and actually um, try them and embody them and watch what happens. Um, we did a seminar for a group of superintendents in, uh, outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, again, another recommendation uh, connection because of Jim. And one of the superintendents said to me, you're telling us I, I should trust people. And we're he, he was about to have a strike. And he's dealing with the union. And he said, you know, are you kidding? And, you know, so Paul and I shared war stories. We've been through strikes. We've done this. We've done that. And we said, here is what we suggest you do. Well, he tried. And I saw him several months later at a national conference. He said, I couldn't believe it. He said, I never would have done what you said, except I decided you guys had some credibility. And I took a risk. And I did something in the relationship in terms of trust that I never would have done. And it just was miraculous what happened. You, you will be, you, you, the, the nice thing about these things is you can empirically test for yourself what happens when you try to operate in accordance with some of these ideas. One of my suggestions is 35 uh, principles is just overwhelming. Eight can even be overwhelming. Pick one. Pick one for a period of time that you decide that you want to nurture within yourself and watch what happens as a result of doing that. Uh, and only if you do that will you get some sense of what I'm talking about when I say there is an underlying energy aspect to these ideas. That's why we call them archetypical seeds that tr begin to transform you and let you then um, send out energy in such a way that as a strange attractor, you will begin to see changes in your environment as a result of doing that. Um, one or two more questions before we shift to the next section. Yes, sir. Yes. I would agree with that. I, I think they, they can be learned. They can be applied. Um, I just, yes, I agree with that. Every one of these things can be learned. Uh, and it's not as hard to learn as we think because we already have the blueprints. We simply have to, the learning part is about basically making a commitment to yourself, sharing that when you're ready with other people, and then paying attention to that particular aspect that you're trying to cultivate in yourself and watching as a reflective practitioner what happens to you and to the people around you. And what happens is this all becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You watch the good things unfold and say, huh, I can do more of that. I can e even share that with other people, that that's what I'm doing. Then they begin to do it. Then it begins to become cultural and organizational. Let me shift gears now because uh, Jim mentioned to me, and so did Arlene, uh, there are two underlying powerful values in this institution. One is social justice, and the other is ethical leadership. And uh, I can tell that these are strongly held values, and they're wonderful values. Um, the people in this room, I have no doubt, know more about social justice than I will ever know. I do not put myself forward as an expert in the area of social justice. I've tried to um, operate and create social justice in every position I've ever held, but I have never been a serious student of it, except in this way. I asked myself, and I did this with ethical leadership as well, what is the overlap or the interface between our spiritual principles and the concept of social justice? So that's what I think I can share with you that may be helpful. 
Um, I'm gonna make sure I push that little timer. Good. And so I identified 12 of our principles that I think in, can inform social justice. So if that's one of your passions, these will then be a series of tools that you can apply in your journey to create more social justice in whatever organizations you serve. First thing I wrote is the principle of fighting for what's right. Now, uh, if you haven't read uh, Moral Courage by Rushmore Kidder, I highly recommend his work to you. Uh, he's done some wonderful thinking in this area. Uh, because social justice requires moral courage. We live in a polarized universe. We live in a dualistic universe, which is to say there are countervailing forces for every thought you ever have. Whatever thought you have, somebody else has the opposite thought. For everything that you think is good, somebody else thinks is bad. And you, you know, I wondered, like, why did the universe get set up that way? It's pretty dynamic. It's a little frustrating when you're pretty sure that what you're doing is a good thing, but somebody else who's looking at it, they don't think it's so good because maybe they're not going to make as much money as a result of the decision that you're making. So they don't think it's such a good thing from their value system. So one of the things you need to commit to for in terms of, of social justice is to fight for the things that you believe in. And by fight, I'm, I'm just talking in terms of making a commitment, being resilient, staying the course, speaking your truth, and um, standing up to bullies and powerful forces that are, will try to block what you're trying to do. And so the willingness to fight for social justice will increase the likelihood that you can bring social justice about. This is not an activity for, uh, you know, what they call lame-hearted or weak-minded weak people. I mean, we're in a business where you need strength to do the kinds of things that we're trying to do. And resilience and commitment and a long-term view. Sometimes I would do something and people would say, they couldn't quite figure out what was going on. I was laying groundwork for something that might take place three years later, five years later, eight years later, ten years later. If you have a long-term view of what it is you're trying to create in terms of your intention, then you can build toward that over time. And these are all elements of fighting for what's right. The principle of a reverence for all living beings. Again, this is one of our principles. Uh, it's fairly commonplace in, in leadership courses to talk about treating people with dignity and respect. And we know that we treat people with dignity and respect, they respond usually with dignity and respect. When Paul and I were writing about this, we said, we really think it's deeper than that. We want to go beyond respect. We want to go to reverence. And the way we do that is many people believe that we all have a divine spark in us. I would say probably 80 to 90% of people in this country believe that in some form. So that's what you can be reverent toward. They may be behaving very badly, but if you can be reverent to the notion that they have a divine spark. And if you focus on that possible divine spark as you're dealing with people, you may actually kindle in something that they've forgotten in terms of the way they're operating. And so treating people in your organization with reverence, whether it's kids or teachers or your colleagues, you can apply that concept in terms of social justice. Uh, because any group that you're trying to bring social justice to can be viewed as a group 
that has that divine spark. And therefore, what treatment are they worthy of? Maybe even reminding people that whatever group it is that you're looking at, they all have a divine spark, maybe just enough to get them to rethink or reframe the way they're looking at whatever group they're looking at. The lesson of balance. Uh, I think Jim mentioned we publish a quarterly newsletter. It's actually a journal. Uh, it's free. It's online. It consists of anywhere between 9 and 13 essays, each of between 500 and roughly 1,000 words. We try to keep them concise on one of the spiritual principles of leadership. They're archived on our website. The one that's coming out at the end of January is on the lesson of balance. We live in a dualistic world. We also live in a world um, where uh, things easily get out of balance. And from an energetic perspective and a physical perspective, you can view um, social justice from a perspective, perspective of equity. Equity in terms of race, equity in terms of ethnic background, ethnic, uh, equity in terms of gender, and on and on and on. Well, if you're thinking about equity, somewhere along the line there must be an inequity because you're trying to go from inequity to equity. From our perspective, that's an issue of balance. If there is something that's unequal, then it's not in balance. Think of the scales of justice. So, you know, there are scales. You know, feminine figure, scales of justice, trying to get things in their right balance. And so the whole notion of balance can be very powerful in terms of looking at social justice. The principle of empowering and uplifting others. All of these principles, the ones that I'm talking about tonight and the other ones that are on our website, every one of them shares one thing in common. They're all empowering. They will all empower you and they will all empower the people that you serve. Guaranteed. They also can be uplifting. And if you think about social justice, aren't we trying to uplift some group that for some reason usually through no fault of their own, needs a leg up, <coughs> needs some support, needs to be uplifted. So again, we use this spiritual principle not just in the context of social justice, but as a general principle of enlightened leadership, that enlightened leaders tend to uplift the people that are around them. When you're around enlightened leaders, you usually go away feeling a little bit better rather than diminished. If you want to know whether you're around an unenlightened leader, you feel diminished, the opposite of uplifted when you're around such people. Uh, we write about this. We talk about people with toxic energy as opposed to people who have uplifting energy patterns. And so you can apply both the, the intention to empower and the intention to uplift to any, I think, social injustice that you're trying to rectify or impact on. Earlier I talked about the principle of at attention. Well, you can apply the principle of attention to the concept of social justice. If you talk about social justice as this institution does, if you live that value as this institution does, you're paying attention to that in a way that's very real for people. It's visceral and it's contagious. And when it's in the service of something that's morally right, then it again begins to grow and expand in a very positive way. And you're not thinking of it, maybe before I came here tonight, that you're actually using a principle of att attention in the way you're using your consciousness and the power that you have as a leader by where you focus your attention and what happens as a result of that. Principle of serving others. We are in the, a service profession. 
uh, again, I took a course today in Arlene. Arlene talked about creating a protective umbrella for the faculty. Uh, I used to try to protect our faculty from the Board of Education and the, and the administrators. I thought that was my job. And they appreciate it because nobody likes to get their heads beaten on. So the protective umbrella is a form of service because by creating the protective umbrella, you create the environment in which people can thrive and grow and be their best versions of themselves. And you can apply that to any social justice issue. You name it, it wouldn't take long to frame that issue in terms of the population that's being served and the way they're being served and what will happen as a result of that service that will be good for the people being served and also good for the people who are working to create uh, those powerful effects in the world. Principle of operating from a base of compassion. Uh, I was talking today about the fact that um, scientist, a professor in, in Florida has done a very interesting study of empathy in uh, higher order mammals and finds that mammals care for each other in a way that shows compassion. And the experiments that are done clearly show that these animals are acting compassionately toward the others in the social group. I'm not surprised by that because I'm saying these things are hardwired in us. It was interesting to know that they're also hardwired in some higher order mammals, not just humans. And so we can operate from a base of compassion. When we do, people observe it. They're watching all the time. You're a leader, people are watching. They know who the person was who was sick or whose child is sick or who was in a car accident or had a tragedy and they see how you as a leader handled that. Did you tell them you be at work at nine o'clock and your personal problems are your personal problems? Or did you find a way to help them during a time of need? Well, when you do that, everybody else in your organization says, huh, maybe I'll be the person in time of need someday. And I'm operating in an organization that cares about people because I saw it for myself. You may never need it, but that person's going to function differently in your organization because they watched you operating from a base of compassion. Well, who needs compassion more than people who are at the other receiving end of people who need social justice? I mean, I view that as a form of compassion in action. Principle of hope versus fear. Lead we believe that enlightened leaders uh, by their very nature are hopeful people. They're, they engender hope in other people. They're, uh, they're just hopeful in the way that they operate in the world. And they are not fear-based. Hope and fear, you know, there are a lot of things that operate in juxtaposition to fear. Fear and love, fear and hope. And one of the antidotes for fear is hope. And uh, in, I can tell you from personal experience, I have been in crisis after crisis where things looked about as rough and tough as you can imagine. I always projected hope in the organizations that I served. And hope always prevailed, one way or another. So the toughest time to be hopeful is in the midst of chaos and darkness. But that's, I believe, your job as an enlightened leader to find that spot. Because there's always a spot of light in the darkness. And if you see it, and you begin to tell other people that it's there, and it's possible, that's the spot that will begin to grow energetically as a result of the way you're functioning as a leader. And you can apply that, again, I think, in the concept of social justice. Don't you want to give hope to the people who ha don't have as much hope as they would be valuable to them in terms of the way they're living their lives or what they see as their possibilities? 
they'll borrow it from you. But you have to give it. You have to have it. And then you can share it. That's what I mean by cultivating it in yourself, because then you can share it. Principle of love. We used to talk about love. You know, Jim was comfortable enough here to use the love word in this setting in terms of our relationship. And I'm comfortable. And the people in our organization actually talked about loving children that we serve. I think it's the highest form of caring. And we want people to love the organizations that we work so hard to create. We want people to treat each other with love. Well, then we can't be afraid as leaders to talk about love as a value in an organization. And to, and the ways it can be demonstrated, I mean, are only limited by our imaginations. I think as we look at uh, social justice, love and compassion go hand in glove in terms of uh, trying to do good in the world where it is needed. We talked earlier about the principle of intention. You can imply all of the things we said in our chapter in Wayne Dyer's book about using your intention to do something positive with respect to social justice. Um, it's a tool. Uh, letting people know. I mean, how interesting was it that at lunch today, you know, after the social uh, discourse of where are you from, and let's talk a little bit about your family and your background, almost immediately, Arlene was talking about the values of this organization. That's the principle of intention in action. She's telling me what the intention of this organization is. And it's good for me to know that. It made me feel good to know that. I can tell you, I go to lots of organizations. I could be there three days before somebody's willing to share what their intentions are, you know, in terms of the of a cultural value of the institution. You've got to pull it out. You know? So again, it, you've got good examples here. A sense of purpose. We, every human being wants to ha feel a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. Enlightened leaders help people connect with their sense of purpose and then operate so that that sense of purpose takes real form and real things happen. You know, I have no doubt that there's going to be a wonderful course in this institution dealing with sustainability because it's part of a passion that Constance has that's going to be nurtured by this organization that's going to ripple out to schools and kids because a sense of purpose is clear and this organization is willing to support that sense of purpose rather than saying, well, that's not what we're about. We're about something else. So that's an example of how everybody has those kinds of passions and interests. How can you as an enlightened leader learn what they are? How can you capitalize on them? And then how can you apply that in the context of social justice? Everybody here has some place in their heart where there's some Thing going on in an institution, an organization, a family, a setting that you feel is unjust and wrong. And wouldn't you like some support in being able to remedy that or move it along in a positive direction? That's connected, I think, with your sense of purpose. The last one I identified is the principle of awareness. Awareness and consciousness are closely linked. And the Frequently, we can't deal with things unless we are aware of them. So many things we think people are aware of, they are not aware of. One of the mistakes I made early on as a superintendent is assuming that people had awarenesses of things that I ultimately found out they did not have awarenesses of. And so open communication in terms of awareness what is it that you are aware of that I will now know? What are you aware about me? What am I aware of in the way I communicate with you? These are the way we get a sense of what other people, what their levels of consciousness are. And one of my interests is how consciousness operates in the universe and how consciousness operates in terms of leadership. People have different levels of awareness. 
Some people see far and they see wide. Other people see very narrow. We all have awareness. Some awareness is like this, some awareness is like that. I would make people nervous very often because sometimes I've been called a visionary. You might think that's a good thing. It scares the hell out of people because they can't always see what you can see. And they think that what you can see may be even be delusional or an illusion. But, so, uh, but having an awareness, a broad horizon line, and sharing that begins to create some alignment between you and the people that you're working with. And certainly an awareness of social justice issues, just talking about them, just pointing somebody's attention. Did you know that? And then you hear a story about what's going on, and you say, I didn't know that. That's going on here? That's not right. That's not what we stand for. We want to do something about that. Come on. Fully Alive by Donna Markova. If you look at our book, the foreword is written by Donna Markova. Donna Markova is a remarkable woman. She's written at least a dozen books dealing with parenting and leadership. She has served as an advisor. You know, we all have mentors. This is a woman who mentors admirals and uh, people who are like four-star generals. And so she, and, and people who are CEOs of some of the largest corporations in America. We're privileged because she is a friend and a colleague and she wrote the foreword to our book. Here is a poem that Donna wrote that I will read to you. I have not memorized it. I will not die an unlived life. I will not live in fear of falling or catching fire. I choose to inhabit my days to allow my living to open me, to make me less afraid, more accessible, to loosen my heart until it becomes a wing, a torch, a promise. I choose to risk my significance, to live so that that which came to me as seed goes to the next as blossom, and that which came to me as blossom goes on as fruit. I hope that all of your blossoms turn into fruit, and I wish you well. Thank you very much. <laughs>